the ninth annual Siege UMD Environmental Justice and Health Disparity Symposium. We're at day two. Hopefully enjoy day one. Uh, this symposium is really about helping communities that are impacted by environmental uh, climate and injustice issues uh, get really come together to address those, those, those problems. This, this is our ninth one. Last year's theme was uh, energy versus power. This year's theme is people, power, and politics. And you think about these issues that we're trying to address, just, just to have a recap of what happened in day one, we had a great uh, opening presentation, a keynote from Reverend Barber, and he talked about moral issues around poverty and you know what we need to do to, as it relates to our shared humanity and how we need to build, uh, build the movement and talk about issues of healthcare, talk about issues of minimum wage, right? Talk about issues of inequality, talk about vulnerable populations and, and, and talk about race, the intersectionality of race and income. And he talked about ecological devastation and how some people have been impacted by, you know, COVID-19, how populations are dealing with these issues of environmental justice. He talked, he mentioned Dr. King's work as it relates to, uh, you know, uh, poverty and civil rights. He talked about the March on Washington, but, you know, it's just, just not about marching. He talked about what do we need to do? What are the, the other things we need to do when it comes to action? We had great concurrent sessions. Uh, during day one, we had uh, sessions that talked about issues around uh, food and climate, sessions that talked about issues of, of energy. We, we had a great uh, lunchtime plenary session, a uh, discussion about reparations and, and, and restorative justice, if not uh, now when, with, with Mustafa Ali, Santiago Ali, with the National Wildlife Federation. And then we had a, a, a great set of uh, sessions in the, in the afternoon that talked about issues that are important to people, right? Issues that are around, again, power, how do we end power? And then issues related to politics. When you think about climate politics, uh, things that are happening around our world, we had a, a international sessions yesterday. We even had issues talk about, you know, cancer. The connection between environmental justice and cancer is one of our sessions of the day. And we closed out the day with a, with a very interesting conversation with colleagues from the NAACP about their work on environmental uh, climate justice issues. I think that session went really well, it's very riveting. And as I was telling some of my colleagues, I think I got a little bit too excited, but how can you not get excited? How can you not be passionate about, again, people? How can you not be passionate about power, right? Building power, growing power, ensuring that those who most impact have the power to make change happen. And how can you not be excited about politics and passionate about politics, not just politics per se in the body politic, but our democracy. And how do you make the democracy work for the people? Democracy is of the people, should be for the people and by the people. And we talk about people in, in environmental justice movement, those are most impacted by environmental hazards. Those are most overburdened by hazards, right? Those are dealing with the, the hellishness of heat waves, if, it, if it, even that's the word, right? Heat waves are hell for the poor and the elderly. Those are impacted differentially by climate change. Those who don't have access to basic amenities, y'all, sewer and water infrastructure, clean uh, uh, housing, safe housing, folks don't have access to public mm -hmm. transit, people who are living in communities where their basic needs are not being met. It's about what we live, what we work, what we play, what we pray, what we learn. We're talking about environmental justice. These are not issues of that we can, uh, of, of, these are issues of great importance, right? These are issues of folks who, we, who need assistance and people who are doing their own work. Let me say this, folks in an environmental justice movement, they are advocating for change. So this symposium is about how we bring together stakeholders those from impacted frontline frontline communities, policymakers, how we bring together youth, how do we bring together the government, how do we bring together business to make sure we're catalyzing that change to, a, to advance environmental justice. I would like to thank our sponsors uh, for this event. Uh, without you, this event wouldn't be possible. So go to the next slide, please. On the sponsor slide. So Meta, you keep going. Let's just, just run through them. Yeah. 
So thank all these sponsors uh, who've been uh, really supportive of our work over the years and uh, work with the symposium this year. Thanks to the University of Maryland School of Public Health. Thanks to the foundation partners. Thanks, for our, thanks to our faith partners who've been really helpful in helping to build some of our faith sessions. And I just want to uh, acknowledge our team, the Siege team, who helped to organize this ninth uh, EJ symposium. Uh, Shawnee, Pamela, also Ariel, uh, Paul Blaine, some of the patients who Blaine Vivek. Uh, also, we have new team members who who assisted with this with this symposium. Uh, Dr. White, uh, Dr. Rontes, and Melissa, and also others. Uh, our jazz team, Eli, um, uh, Holland, Bacola, and then we have other uh, UMD staff who've assisted um, with with Daryl. Out of communication and others, so one I don't can't name everybody, and also some new team members, Lakeem, who's helping out with IT support today. So, thank you, thank you, thank you for all your all your work, and thanks also to again others uh, who will be assisting us with Thursday and Saturday. We'll have food from Bus Boys and Poets. Thanks to the hotels, and just again, thanks for all the different thanks to all the different uh, planning committees that have helped to plan various sessions, plenary sessions, concurrent sessions, and just again, making sure this symposium is a successful event. So now I'd like to move forward with introducing our speaker for today. And again, everyone, our theme for the symposium is people, power, and politics. In today's opening keynote speaker, we have Robin Morris Collin. Now I know Robin, I don't know, 15, is it 15 plus years? Something like that? More. more. <laughs> yeah, was, you know, you get, you know, oh, it's 20 years now. <laughs> Something like 15 plus 20 years. But uh, she's going to do our, our keynote uh, opening address today. She is the senior advisor uh, to the EPA administrator, senior advisor on environmental justice to the EPA administrator. And it's exciting to have Robin here because she has a wealth of experience, uh, you know, being a fellow academic. She was previously the Norma Paulus Professor of Law at Willamette University College of Law in Oregon. She was the first U.S. law professor to teach sustainability courses in a U.S. law school. She's a she was she's been a convener, co-convener of the Oregon Electric Vehicle Collaboration, a commissioner on the Oregon Commission for Women. She's also served previously as the, she served as the founding chair of the legislatively created Oregon Environmental Justice Task Force. She's been awarded uh, uh, the David Brower Lifetime Achievement Award from the Public Interest Environmental Law Conference, the, the, the Oregon Woman of Achievement Award for 2012, the Leadership and Sustainability Award from the Oregon State Bar. There's a lot of awards here, everybody. <laughs> Environmental Justice Achievement Award from US EPA and she's a founding member of the Environmental Justice Action Group of Portland and the founding member of the Lawyers uh, for Sustainable Future. While at the University of Oregon, she co-founded the Conference Against Environmental Racism and the Sustainable Business Symposium, both of which continue into that second decade. So Robin has a wealth of experience in this field. Uh, she's been like a, a, a mentor to me, I can say that, and really appreciate Robin being here is one of those thought leaders in this space and great to see her in this and her role uh, advising the EPA administrator on environmental justice. So let's welcome, and I know y'all can clap, but let's welcome our keynote speaker for the day, Robin Morris Collin, and I will pass the mic to you, Robin. Thank you so much, Dr. Wilson. And indeed, we have known each other since 2002 because we met at the Second People of Color Conference, and I was talking about environmental reparations back in 2002. So it's been a long journey to a wonderful moment, and I want to thank you for including me in this momentous group of speakers and thinkers. I want to thank your wonderful team for pulling together a convening that truly has a sense of purpose. This isn't just to shake hands and build resumes. We're doing the work here. And that's because <clears throat> of wonderful leadership like yours. Uh, thanks to Bishop Barber for his early guidance and continued shepherding of our work. Um, when I say that this is a convening with a sense of purpose, I want to focus in on your themes because it is such 
a moment in time for us. Bishop Barber yesterday told us to consider where we are, where we are at right now, and we are at a crisis. The thing about a crisis that goes on for a fairly long period of time is that there's a sense of normalizing crisis. And we have to fight that sense that we are in normal times. We're not. There's nothing normal about the climate crisis. It's something that humans have done. And if we don't fix it and transform ourselves at the same time, we will be beyond crisis. We are facing an opportunity to transform, but opportunity requires work. And I wanna to talk to you a little bit about what that work for us and for our group as we convene today and for the rest of the week, what that work has to look like. I think we need to understand the power that we have and it's ours to exercise or squander and that makes a difference now. We have to be fearless in using the power that we have. And I'm really looking forward to our lunchtime speaker, Justin, who's going to talk to us about owning our own power and keeping it. Uh, we also have this duty to organize and mobilize to make a future that we actually want. I called on our builders and our creators to help us build a future that we actually do want, even as our advocates continue to fight against a future that's poisonous and that we do not want. So we now have resources so that we can build a future we want, not simply react to what we don't want. Let me start with my last year and a half. I joined EPA uh, in 2022, and in September 26th, almost a year ago, I went with uh, Michael Regan, my boss, the administrator of the EPA, and Reverend Barber, and Dr. Wilson, and many others from the oldest and earliest struggles for environmental justice. We were all together in Warren County. And at that point, EPA launched a new national program for environmental justice in civil rights. At that point in time, about a year ago, year and a half, we did not have a budget of more than I would say $3 million. That was our budget at the time. I say that because within that calendar year, money started to flow to EPA. And we will talk more about that flow, that flood of money. That put almost $100 billion into the green and just infrastructure that Bishop Barber called on us to create. And that resource redistribution function has really changed part of what EPA does and what it has to do in the future. It must distribute those resources. And of course, President Biden has called upon and promised to redistribute the governmental resources through Justice 40, righteous justice, making sure that 40% of all of these billions, multiple billions of dollars benefit our communities, the communities that have been left out of the promise of environmental justice for far too long. Much has been promised, I know that. And much remains to be done. We know that that flood of money is going to unleash opportunity, but it also must be carefully guarded so that the money flows to the communities that it is intended to benefit. So to ensure that at EPA and across the government as I have seen it this past year and a half, there's been a deliberate effort to redesign the structures that deliver money to our communities, an intentional redesign of access to resources. You know, it's often said that our communities lack capacity. And I find that 
I find that phrase irksome. I'll tell you why. We don't lack capacity. We lack access to resources. You will find that our communities are bursting to the brim with ideas and entrepreneurship. We just haven't had access to resources. And when we do have access to resources, you will see a different future emerge. We at EPA have redesigned the way that we approach distributing resources and the way the cornerstone of this new approach are called Thriving Community Technical Assistance Centers. These Tic Tacs, Thriving Community Technical Assistance Centers, are located in every region. We have multiple partners and here's what makes them different. The Tic Tacs are trusted partners. The Tic Tacs are people that know our communities and have worked in our communities and have relationships with our communities. And those are the people that we have deliberately reached out to, to ask us to help distribute resources to our communities, trusted partners. I also listened to Secretary Becerra uh, a few weeks ago. He is also in that same recognition moment. We have resources to distribute and what is essential for us to do is to make sure that we do not default to an older path of distributing those resources. If we simply default to the old known ways of distributing resources, we know where they go and they don't go to our communities. At EPA, we've also redistributed, redesigned the way we distribute money for water, clean water, waste water treatments. We've redesigned the financial systems. Doing that takes time. And I know that one of the questions, I'm pretty sure one of the questions will be, show me, show me what you all are doing with all of this money. Show me what's happening on the ground. That's a legitimate question and we will. There are things happening on the ground, but if at this moment in time, we had simply defaulted to quote shovel ready projects, if we had simply defaulted to the existing streams of distributing money, you know what happens and it isn't good for our communities. So we have taken time, almost a full year of time to redesign the basic structures of access. And that is work that is well worth doing because it puts transformation within our reach. I'll say that again. It puts, when we redesign distribution of resources, the effect is to bring transformation to us within our reach. Before that, it's just theory. It's just language in a statute that has no feet on the ground. So one of the things that I really in, enjoyed uh, with Dr. Reverend, uh, Reverend Bishop Barber, all of his many titles, was that he really emphasized that we have to understand where we are, where we actually are. And knowing that gives us the vision to align our power with our outcomes. Let me start with a couple of things that I think are critical to understand about where we are. Number one, we know that the majority of this country will be multiracial, mixed race, multi-ethnic, multi-religious, and multi-class soon. We know as a matter of fact that that is going to be the character and demographic reality of our nation. And that scares some people absolutely to death. The fear of a truly multiracial, multi-ethnic democracy is scaring certain people who have benefited from a legacy of lies about race and lying about race 
they've benefited and they're afraid to lose that power. So what they do, because they are scared of the reality that is true, what they do is they use racism to sow fear and to make money. There, there, there's a kind of hate grift being run on this country. And the only way for us to retake the power that is ours is to recognize we are who we are. We are multi-ethnic, multi-race, mixed race. And we, when we speak this way, are the majority. This is who we are. The problem also was put to us by Bishop Barber yesterday. He said, most of us don't vote. It's not a Republican Democrat thing. It's the problem is that most, the majority of us do not vote. If we voted, we would take the power that is ours in a democracy. So we know as a fact, what this country is. We know that. And we know that we have the power to shape it when we vote. Finally then, I think we come to this notion of politics and the duty to mobilize in this moment. It's one thing, and I understand and honor this, it's one thing to learn to critique where we are. We have had to re-educate ourselves because so many of us were miseducated. We have to learn to see through the misdirection of fearful, hateful people who are always throwing out fearful, hateful things to react to, but we have to educate ourselves to stand firm in the future that we control and that is ours. Um, it's, it's one thing to critique all of that and to learn how to critique it, but we also have to build a future that we actually do want. We need our engineers and we need our architects, we need our planners, we need our social workers, we need all of the people who understand the kind of connective tissue that we need to stand up a nation that is multi-ethnic, that is clean and green and prosperous. We know how to do all of those things. We have to mobilize to do them. Clean air, clean water, clean soil, soil that supports life, chemicals that work with nature, that don't kill workers. These things are the foundation of all health and all wealth. We know that. And they belong to all people. It's just that some people have been left out of that promise. And so it is incumbent upon us now at this moment when we have both the resources to redistribute and the leadership in place to do it. It's incumbent upon us to bring these communities into the protection of the law. I wanna stop for a moment and just talk about that protection of the law. In this country, it really wasn't until the 14th Amendment was passed that formerly enslaved people were brought within the protection of the law. And it's a terrible thing to live outside of the protection of the law. Anything can happen to you and you have no recourse except for perhaps retribution and vengeance. We know what it looks like to have a lawless future because we have had in many places a lawless past that's not a good road to be on. And therefore we must really redouble our efforts to bring all communities within the protection of the law, the environmental laws the civil rights laws, all communities must be brought within that protection. And that requires us to go forward as partners. No single entity is going to be capable of doing that. We have come a long way but we have a long way to go, as we always say in the movement, we have a long way to go. 
And we need to travel that distance now as partners. And I wanna talk a little bit more about partnership. In the past, our communities haven't been seen as partners and we have not centered our work with them as partners should. There are various tools in place and you'll see many of them uh, in the later lineups on today's panels. There are tools that we can use to begin to partner effectively. We can start to see the conditions in our communities and we can come to understand how to deploy resources to those communities as partners. This is a really challenging task. It's easy to say, but for government co-regulators to get in alignment, to see our community's lived experience and to approach our communities as a whole of government is a real task because we don't tend to talk to one another in the government. The, from the outside, it looks as though the government is one um, homogenous group. It isn't, it's far from it, but we have resources to redistribute and we must begin to communicate effectively about how to deploy those resources where they're needed the most. In addition, the lived experience of communities hasn't been part of the planning for deployment. We need to understand the real conditions that communities live with. And I've been very privileged to work on a project at EPA that involves cumulative impacts. Cumulative impacts allow us to begin, I say begin, to see the real lived conditions on the ground that communities experience in their daily lives. Too often, the government has walked into communities wearing very siloed stovepiped hats. And they only see a portion of what a community is living with and they don't want to see more than that. As we face this opportunity to redistribute resources, we also should be looking at the lived experiences that we face um, as communities come together and tell us about their lived experiences and as we begin to learn how to measure and make visible what has been invisible, and that is the lived experience on the ground. So I urge you to listen to the experiences of uh, New Jersey and Chicago and their work towards lifting up into visibility the cumulative impacts of com on communities. But that takes us to the next logical step, which is, what are you going to do about it? And what we do about it really requires partnership. There is no one entity that has an adequate understanding without community involvement to actually remedy or provide a comprehensive remedy. What we must do is to link arms and follow communities as we find our way into transforming communities with the resources that we now have. I want to um, head towards the end of my talk with a story, but before we get there, let me suggest that some of the tools we have are not just cumulative impacts, and of course, at at EPA, we're very profoundly proud of EJ Screen and other tools of that nature. But as an educator, I want to point us towards another set of tools that we have to become more and more sophisticated 
as at using. We must begin to point at misdirection and call it out for what it is. We must begin with real sense of purpose here to call out lies each and every time, every time. Because this misdirection and lying serves greed and that greed is killing us. Misdirection, lying and greed have a way of recreating themselves in every generation in a new way. But we are in a position to reject them even as we design a future that we do want. But let me turn back once more to my, to my theme of partnership here. Partners have mutual expectations and they, we, partners need to understand what we expect by way of outcomes and how we propose to get there. We also, in order to be good partners, need to build a trusting relationship. And what you will see in the IRA legislation, the money for the IRA legislation, the billions of dollars, is that it gives these opportunities, financial resources, based on partnerships, partnerships between community-based organizations, partnerships with community-based organizations. It's not just the formulaic approach to states, some of it is, but much of it is not. It requires partnership with municipalities and others. And let's be honest, those partnerships are not always easy. Partly because in the past, mistakes have been made and people have done things that feel like betrayal. We must learn to forgive in order to partner for a future. We have the means at our disposal almost. We are getting close to that moment when millions and billions of dollars will fund the future that we really do want, but we have to be able to link arms and we haven't always effectively done that. I wanted to end my talk today with a story because sometimes I find stories convey a complex message that can stay with you as we work our way through this path forward. This story comes from John Lewis's autobiography, <clears throat> Walking with the Wind. And it's right at the beginning of the book in the prologue. He's talking about a stormy uh, day, Sunday, a Saturday, I'm sorry. And he was playing at his aunt's house Aunt Zeneva, and there were 15 of the kids who were all joined playing, fooling around outside when they saw lightning and thunder, heard thunder, and they were afraid because it really looked uh, kind of that greenish light, almost hurricane light. So he saw a bolt of lightning and all the kids then paid attention and Aunt Zeneva said, okay, come on, we're gonna go inside. And there were 15 kids in this small house. So all the kids were squeezed inside. And I'll just read to you a little bit from the book. The wind was howling now and the house was starting to shake. Sorry, one of those Zoom moments. Um, so the house was starting to shake, and he says, we were scared. Even Aunt Seneva was scared, and then it got worse. Now the house was starting to sway. The wood plank flooring beneath us began to bend. And then a corner of the room started lifting up. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. None of us could. The storm was actually pulling the store, the house, towards the sky with us inside it. That was when Aunt Seneva told us to clasp hands. 
Line up and hold hands, she said, and we did as we were told. Then she had us walk as a group toward the corner of the room that was rising. From the kitchen to the front of the house, we walked, the wind screaming outside, sheets of rain beating on the tin roof. Then we walked back in the other direction as another end of the house began to lift. And so it went back and forth, 15 children walking with the wind, holding that trembling house down with the weight of our small bodies. He says, more than half a century has passed since that day, and it has struck me more than once that over those many years, that our society is not unlike the children in that house, rocked again and again by the winds of one storm or another, the walls around us seeming at times as if they might fly apart. It seemed that way in 1960s, at the height of the civil rights movement, when America itself felt as if it might burst at the seams, how close are we today? But the people of conscience never left the room. I'll say this again, the people of conscience never left the room. They never ran away, they stayed, they came together and they did the best they could, clasping hands and moving toward the corner of the house that was the weakest. Children holding hands, walking with the wind, that is America to me, says John Lewis. Not just the movement for civil rights, but the endless struggle to respond with decency, dignity, and a sense of brotherhood to all the challenges that we face as a nation as a whole. So let me stop uh, there. I think that that is a beautiful story and a beautiful man to tell us the path forward and how to get there. I think that this will leave us with um, a good amount of time for some questions. So I think that the way we're going to do this is to ask people to put questions into the chat. Comments, of course, are welcome. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for your, your keynote address that opens up for the day and I appreciate the story from John Lewis, you know, walk with the wind and how we need to move uh, together. Uh, through these tough times as the wind blows, uh, brotherhood, and, and and things may get tough, but we have to keep moving forward. So that's that's one path forward. And I appreciate your comments about communities not having the capacity. They have capacity, just it's access. How you create access and opportunity. I, I would say, as we wait on questions, like one question, uh, one of the uh, uh, comments you made around this moment with the dollars that are available uh, from the you know federal government, uh, this moment, this focus on environmental justice, which is one that, you know, this, I, I think it's a, a big moment as it relates to environmental justice. And, and, and in fact, there's actually dollars available. But what about, you know, you said we shouldn't uh, focus on shovel ready, because shovel ready is not going to really benefit our communities. But what about the critiques from folks about, uh, you, you said you waited a year to get dollars out, you know, and make sure it's, but I think for a lot of community partners we work with, they, it's, it's overwhelming the amount of uh, RFPs, the number of announcements, the amount of information uh, is fast and furious. Even the uh, one program that I think is problematically uh, been implemented, and I would have shared this, the Solar for All program, you had to submit a letter of intent by a certain date. Uh, and, and, and the folks who could apply for that program uh, didn't seem that they're really nonprofit groups. It seems that there are other types of groups. So it seems like a, uh, with a lot of the programs, this, this opportunity being created and show it ready is, is, is great. It's not, show, you're not going to show it ready approach, but are the, are, are there, is there differential access to these opportunities because of the speed, because of the technical detail and because of the, the number of RPs and also because of some of the barriers that we may be creating with the process. I know I just asked a lot, but. Yeah. You know, I think what we would like to create is a one-stop shop where people have an entry point and from that entry point, kind of like the greeter at Walmart, they will tell you where to go to put together the complete shopping list. I can tell you we are working on that, but it is really tough to get 
the government agencies who are charged with these um, distributing these resources to agree on a one-stop shop. We are starting. And that one-stop shop is beginning, but it's gonna take us a little bit more time, but it's there and it works for EPA funds. It works for some Department of Energy funds. It works for water funds. And we're hoping that it will also provide navigation to other funds, for example, those that are in HHS. These are the Tic Tacs. The Tic Tacs are, as I say, they are a hub and spokes model. You know this, Dr. Wilson, because you helped us design some of this. Yes. We are taking a hub in each region of the country, and in some areas, uh, we've got two hubs, and asking them to find trusted partners closer to the ground. And here's what these hub and spokes should be able to do. And I, I believe they are doing this. You go to them, you say, here's my idea, but I don't know what I need to do. See, that's the, the access question. It's what, if you knew what you needed to do, you probably would have already done it. It's the fact that you don't even know where to start. What do I need to do? These are the people who can help. So they will tell you, okay, here's what you need to do. You need a particular registration. You need to go through a nonprofit process. You need all of these different steps. And you say, well, how am I going to do that? And they will help do that. They will help you do all of the things that you need to do. So what I'm saying to people who may be listening now is you have big dreams or you had them at one point. I'll give you an example. Did you ever have a dream of turning that old school in the neighborhood that's now been abandoned into an energy hub? Maybe you did. How are you going to do that? Especially if that isn't with the way that you're currently earning your living. If you're currently a busboy and a poet, but you have dreams, I'm saying take your dreams and walk into a Tic Tac and say, here's what I, here's what I want to do. Help me think this through. And that's partnership. Partnership is helping each other think it through and finding your way to the resources. We are saying we want to help not only be partners, but to find partners, to make partners in these enterprises. That's a start. Yeah, thank you for that. Uh, just for a quick response, uh, uh, Someone asked a question about the Tic Tacs, and that acronym is TCTACs. Uh, I believe there were 17 initially funded uh, that recompete in Region 1 and Region 8. I'm actually co director of the Region 3 Tic Tac uh, with Dr. Adrian Hollis with the National Wildlife Federation. Um, and so that our Region 3 co covers Delaware, DC, Maryland, Virginia, West Virginia, and Pennsylvania. And uh, for those of you who will be attending in person, Thursday and Saturday. We'll have some sessions on Friday, but we'll have some Tic Tac related sessions. Introducing our Tic Tac, uh, talking about, you know, some of the plans for the Tic Tac, meeting the community hubs, that hub and spoke uh, a, a set of approach that uh, um, Robin mentioned. And then also we'll have some workshops related to the Tic Tac on Friday and Saturday. So I just wanted to share that real quick. I'm not sure if my team could put a link to the in the in the chat for the attendees on the Tic Tac. Uh, if you can do that, please do so. Uh, so, uh, so one question that we have from the audience, and thank you audience members for sharing your questions. I see that someone made a comment about shovel ready. Um, and we talk about community readiness. Do, does, this, does this really perpetuate racial practices, racist practices, because we know who has historically received resources. So are they, so they are now ready. So, so basically this comment about, you know, who's, who's ready to, to actually apply for dollars? Who's ready to actually receive dollars? And are the systems in place to really make sure that the, the monies are going to the right people to apply for those dollars? 
Yeah, let me explain my thinking about this. And I'd love to hear in the chat and from you, Dr. Wilson, what your thoughts are. When people call out things like shovel ready, to me, <clears throat> I see these same old general contractors who get the kind of money all the time and they do not distribute it to our subcontractors or to our small businesses. Uh, it's a pipeline that has made people wealthy for hundreds of years off of government projects and somehow that pipeline never I won't say somehow, we know exactly how, the redlining never distributed that money to our community. So I'm not <clears throat> prepared to defend everything the government does, but, <laughs> yeah. um, right? But I think that there was a, an intention, for example, with some of the early uh, <laughs> pandemic funding, to try to benefit people, but they said, yes, let's do things on a shovel ready. Let's get it going. And that money evaporated. It never even got close to our communities. Okay, so we learn and grow. We aren't going down that road twice. And that is why I'm, <clears throat> I'm trying to, to answer two things with this response. I hear the sense of urgency, but I know about urgency. Yes, things are urgent. We need to get that money and it needs to hit the ground. And I know that in order to ensure that, we have to think our way through it first. If we react, we will waste resources. We need to be in that thoughtful, deliberate, transformative redistribution mindset. And in order to get there, we need to design a process that doesn't look like anything that went before. And with the help of people on this call, with the help of brilliant people like Dr. Wilson, we have thought it through, we have redesigned, we have, and we are going to roll it out in a different way. Does redesign take time? Yeah, but not as much as you might think. I mean, it isn't like we redesign things without having some ideas before, without having the, the hard work. And this is where I, will, I wanna credit my EJ brothers and sisters. We have done this work for 30 years, more. I've just been in it for 30 years. It was happening before I got involved. And we have a root system all over this country that is ready to receive. When I say we have a root system, I mean on the ground, in the ground, ready to receive. Now we have the resources and those resources haven't been there for very long. The IRA bill passed a little over a year ago. Now we have resources like water to pour onto the roots and watch us grow. Watch us grow because the thing is we don't lack capacity. We lack access. access. Yeah. It looks like you, you're gonna make me have to change my uh my tic tac presentation. <laughs> we got capacity issues. Nope. Robin says not capacity. Correct yourself, Dr. Wilson. It's an access issue. So differential access needs to be the you don't want environmental justice, differential burden, you know, you know, differential access to differential opportunity. That's something you just wanna to, to hit on. Can Look, I offer my own uh, my own story, I'm not sure how much time we have, but we have, I just we have a little more minutes. Go ahead. I, I, I want to give you an example of what I mean. My father um, founded the first and the only African American owned ocean going vessel line. Now, for those of you who remember Marcus Garvey, I want you to understand he chartered all of his vessels. My father was the first owner of an ocean going. African-American owned ocean going vessel line. My father uh, was the third generation of um, third generation of academic. And like many academics, we have a good life, but we aren't rich. So how do you get into a capital intense uh, industry like owning ships, ship owning, 
um, from an academic background? And the answer was he thought differently about it. He went around and found partners in Amsterdam who wanted to joint venture and he created a stake out of an 8A set aside program that matched his joint venture partners. We bought our first vessel that way. We had chartered business from the government and that paid the note on the vessel. And we were able to buy out our joint venture partners and buy two other vessels. That's success. Now here, why am I telling you this story? We do not lack ideas. Mm -hmm. We do not lack entrepreneurialism, mm -hmm. but we have not had access to resources, resources of scale that you need for big dreams. But I guarantee you that because I know people and you know people, we all know people who have not just big dreams, but they're pretty brilliant people, mm -hmm. but they have not right. had the access that they needed, access to the education. We need engineers, we need scientists, we need architects, planners, social workers. We need people who know how to build things. If I can tell you one other story, I, one of my favorite students uh, said to me, he said, Robin, professor, he's a professor. <clears throat> you know, I think you guys were right back in the 60s. Now, I'm not quite that old, but okay. Um, so he said, I think you were right about equality and, and peace and being anti-war and civil rights. I, I was nodding. I thought, okay, great. I'm talking to somebody who, you know, great, great, great. And he says, but uh, it, it, what happened? <laughs> mm -hmm. What happened? And as I ponder that question, I will tell you as an older activist, here's what I think happened. We knew what we didn't want, but we didn't know how to build what we did want. And what I want to reach out to are people like my father, brilliant people with ideas on how to build things, how to make things work, how to construct a future. That's powerful. So that's not just being a, a, in the EJ movement, not just being a, against something. What are you for? And how do you build it and make it happen? How do you, you know, take the hopes and dreams and actualize that, right? So no, that's no great, great, uh, great stories. I think some powerful statements to just share with everybody. Your father, that's a great story. I mean, lots of ideas there. That's pretty cool stuff. We got uh, seven minutes left. We're gonna try to do lightning round, Robin. We have a little, okay. we have more questions and comments. So I'm gonna jump around a little bit in these comments. So Deborah asks, where do we start? <laughs> We start with a vision. Uh, and here's what I like to start with in terms of vision. What do I look like when I'm happy? What do you look like when you're happy? What do our children look like when they're happy? What are they doing when we're happy? How do we make a happy future? Now, when I ask that question, I often think of people outside. And I think of people enjoying life and fooling around, not programmed, mind you, but fooling around, which I think is great, greatly underrated, fooling around outside and having fun, maybe in a garden. We need to build I was, a I was thinking that you read my mind. Sorry, <laughs> I was thinking about my garden. Yeah, but see? go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> We need to begin with a vision of what we actually look like when we're happy. And we need to build towards what makes us healthier, happier, more whole people. So if wouldn't it be wonderful if the way we spent our waking hours on this earth was making more room for people to grow things and to grow with growing things. We can do that. We can do that. And then, of course, you know, you asked me where to start. And I start with what can I see? I am disturbed by the fact that people fill their minds with dystopian visions. 
If your mind and your vision is filled with dystopian stuff, we will get that. Yeah. We're, we're kind of strange. You know, human animals are, are really extraordinary when you put us into a spectrum of the animal world. We're really quite extraordinary because we seem to be able to imagine things that other animals don't have that imaginative capacity for. But that's also our weakness. We need to start with these visions. I like to keep pictures around me of my friends and family when we're happy. And believe me, during pandemic, my mother died during pandemic. Um, many of us have kind of forgotten what it's like to be happy. Um, so I think that's that's my my initial take. No, thank you for that. I think one quick little comment on that. Uh, was it a, a, a workshop at EPA? I'm not sure what to say about it. On climate change and communication, I'll just say that. And I said, you know, folks have done a great job of saying that the world's going to end with climate change. Great job. Dystopia is coming. Climate anxiety is coming. Why can't we have more of a positive vision uh, of working together to mitigate and to transform and to build and grow? That was basically my comment. So I, I, I think that's for us. This, this, if you take anything home, everybody, yes, there's issues and problems, but what are the solutions that we can work together on? And then that vision can make you happy as an individual and make our communities. How can we can grow healthy, safe, equitable communities that adjust with opportunity, right? Just want to say that that's that's what the Egypt movement is about. Yes, there's problems, but we got to be about solutions that arc towards justice. Right? You can't be in this movement uh, and and be and have a negative vision for the future. That's not. It's a movement of hope, right? It's a movement from moving from surviving to thriving, as Mustafa likes to say a lot, right? So let's let's go to another uh, question. We have three minutes left. My lightning uh, uh, moderation uh, moderator is not going well. I'm gonna try to give you a couple more <laughs> quick quick ones in. Sorry, but this is, this is a great conversation we're having. So. One of the things that um, the questions that someone asked is, uh, there, there. This is the first question we received. They're an eco poet. Is this movement for them? Oh, How can they contribute? Yes. Oh my gosh. You. Where would you be without our poets? You know, poets are the people who speak the truth to power, not politicians. And most of the time, if you're, you're, <laughs> we used to say this back in the day, if you're paying a mortgage, you're not really in a position to speak truth to power either. Poets, artists, you have to be the people to stand up and say, so, th and give us a story that carries us forward. I almost uh, read this poem to you, and I, I want to just read just a, a word or two of it. Do you remember Boondocks, Dr. Wilson? Yeah. Yes, 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 yes. I love Boondocks. If you haven't seen Boondocks, just go into YouTube and watch yourself. But the, the original lyrics to the song, the theme for Boondocks, I was reminded of it by Reverend Bishop Barber yesterday. I am the stone that the builder rejected. I am the visual, the inspiration that made the lady sing the blues. I am the spark that makes your idea bright, the same spark that lights the dark so that you can know your left from your right. I am the ballot in your box, the bullet in your gun, the inner glow that lets you know to call your brother's son, the story that's just begun, the promise of what's to come, and I'm gonna remain a soldier until the war is won. That's what we need. And to be exactly. part of to be part of a movement made of the stones that were rejected, that's me. I think that's many of us. How can we how can we build with those stones, right? Love some boondocks. Just a quick shout to Mustafa. If y'all didn't know, Mustafa's writing poetry all the time. He's put you go on his uh his um Twitter page, you'll see poetry about what's happening in the world. But I think poets, art is very part of this. Humanities is that narrative. A narrative, again, of hope, a narrative of truth, a narrative of power. Uh, again, people, power, and politics. We need poets. We need artists in this movement. As Mustafa said yesterday, as Reverend Yearwood with the Hip Hop Caucus is working with artists, will say on Saturday. 
So we need all folks who are engaged in this movement. Again, uh, bridging, uh, clasping our hands together, as John Lewis said, right, as we move forward and it, as this wind blows us different ways, but as we keep moving forward through the wind. So I really want to thank you, uh, uh, Robin, for this great opening keynote. Love the stories. Uh, great information. Love the story about your father. Again, uh, didn't know that. That's, that's great to hear. And really powerful words. I hope all the audience, you've taken some uh, good uh, pointers about, you know, these resources and infrastructure, engaging with the Tic Tacs and other hubs that are out there. Uh, we'll have more sessions today about various hubs, a Waverly Street session about the uh, their climate action hubs. We'll have uh, other sessions today about money, uh, ex exactly as Robin mentioned. There'll be some more discussions about the dollars coming out of the EPA today in the EPA year in review session. And then uh, just please uh, continue to join our sessions. Uh, please continue to add your great comments and uh, questions. And please continue to learn, you know, that I think you said education, right, Robin? Education and learning. Uh, and how do, you, how, do you, how do you bring education into this too and how we're educating each other and how we're growing together and how we're building together. So thank you, everybody. And um, next set of sessions start at 1110. Thank you again, uh, Robin. Good luck, everybody.